Before we proceed further with ASP.NET Go concepts, let's first take a pause and try to understand some important web-related concepts like request response, headers, status code, etc. We use ASP.NET Code to create web applications. So in this course, our main goal is to learn how to create a web application or how to do backend development using ASP.NET Go. So if you understand how the web actually works and how you as a backend developer plays a role in that, it will make understanding other ASP.NET Go concepts easier. So in this section, in the next few lectures, we are going to talk about the HTTP request and response, status codes, request and response headers, etc. Basically, in this section, we are going to dive deep into how web actually works. Now, if you already have some idea on how the HTTP request and response works, then you can skip this section. But if you really want to understand how the web works, then this section is for you. So let's start this section by learning about the client server architecture in this lecture. Now, when working with web applications, we always have a client which makes a request and we have a server which receives the request and sends a response back to the client. A client can be any application which can connect to internet, for example, web browsers, Android apps, iOS apps, desktop apps, etc. Here in our example, we are using the browser as our client. And a server simply means a computer which is connected to the internet and which can be accessed by other devices. This computer has a special software which can receive requests and send responses. And this software is called as web server. Examples of web server are IIS, Apache, etc. So keep in mind that a web server is what makes a computer real server. Then only that computer is capable of receiving requests and sending responses. Now let's say on this server, we have our ASP.NET Core application running. And the IP address of this server is 192.168.20.134. So this is just for demo. So we have a server. On that server, we have our ASP.NET Core application running and the IP address of this server is this. Now what we want is from the browser, from the client, we want to access this ASP.NET Core application. To do that, we need to type the URL of that ASP.NET Core application in the browser's address bar. So let's say this is the domain address for this ASP.NET Core application. We need to type this domain address in the address bar of the browser in order to access this ASP.NET Core application. Okay, so to access this ASP.NET Core application, in the browser's address bar, we are typing www.demoapp.com. So this demoapp.com is the domain name for this ASP.NET Core application. And from this ASP.NET Core application, we want to access the home page. So after this domain name, we are also using this slash and we are specifying the resource name. Here, the resource name is home. Basically, in the response, we want to get the HTML of home page. So when we type that URL in the address bar of the browser and when we press enter, the client will send a request to the server where that application is hosted. And the server will then process the request and it will send back the response with the requested data. Here we have requested for the home page. So in the response, the server will send the HTML of that home page. Okay, so here from the client, we send an HTTP request to the server and the server then send the HTTP response with the requested data. And this process is called as request response model or the client server architecture. Most of the things about the web development revolves around this fundamental concept. Now, this might look very simple process of sending the request to the server and then receiving the response, but in reality, it is not simple as it looks. So let's try to dive deep into the concept of client server architecture and let's try to understand what actually happens behind the scenes when we make a request to the server. So here, the first question which will come to your mind is, when we make a request by typing a domain name in the browser, how does the client know to which server it has to send the request and from which port number it has to access the application? Let's try to answer this question. The first thing which you need to understand here is that the domain name which we type in the address bar of the browser, for example, google.com, facebook.com, or in our example, this demoapp.com, that is not the real address of the server where the application is hosted. It's just a nice name which is easy for us to remember. In reality, the server does not have a name. It has an IP address. For example, 
our ASP.NET Go application here in this example is hosted on this server. And this server has this IP address 192.168.20.134. So when we type this domain name in the address bar of the browser, we need a way of converting this domain name into the real address of the server to the IP address of the server where the web application is actually hosted. And this happens through a DNS. DNS stands for Domain Name Server. And these are special type of servers that are basically like the phone book of the internet. So whenever we type the URL in the browser and when we press enter, the request is not made immediately. Before sending the request to the server, client makes a request to the DNS server to resolve the domain name with the actual server address. The DNS server is basically responsible for matching the domain name of the application with the actual IP address of the server where the application is hosted. So DNS server here, it simply matches the web address that we typed into the browser to the server's real IP address. In our example, the DNS has matched the www.demoapp.com with the IP address of the server where our ASP.NET Co application is hosted. Also, every application is hosted on some port number. Let's say our ASP.NET Co application is hosted on port number 8000. So in the actual web address, after the IP address, you will also see the port number where the application is hosted. So the IP address colon the port number where the application is hosted. This constitutes the real web address of the web application. Okay, so what you need to remember here is that domain name is not the real address of the web application and DNS server is responsible for matching the domain name to the real IP address. Once the domain name is matched with the server, DNS will send the real server address back to the browser. Once we have the real web address of the ASP.NET Co application, a TCP IP socket connection is established between the client and the server. This TCP IP socket connection is kept alive for the entire time it takes to send the request and receive the response. Once the response is received, this TCP IP connection is closed. So the point to understand here is that the TCP IP connection is established for each new request. Every time we send a request, the TCP IP connection is established and as soon as we receive the response, the TCP IP connection is closed. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol and IP stands for Internet Protocol. A protocol basically means a set of rules. TCP and IP protocols together are the communication protocols that defines exactly how the data transfers across the web. These protocols are basically the Internet's fundamental control system because again, these protocols are the one which sets the rule about how the data moves on the internet. Okay, so in the first step, the domain name was resolved and in the second step, TCP IP socket connection is established between the client and the server. And now it's finally time to make a request from the client to the server. Keep in mind that the request which we make is an HTTP request. We also have something called as HTTPS, which I will explain later, but Basically, we either make an HTTP request or HTTPS request. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol and it is another type of protocol which allows clients and web servers to communicate with each other. So here, we are sending an HTTP request from the client to the server. This HTTP request contains some information which the server needs in order to process the request. And this HTTP request looks something like this. So here for the HTTP request, the first line is the start line. In the start line, we have the HTTP method which we are using to make the request. Basically, here we are using the get request, but we also have other types of HTTP methods like post, put, patch, delete, etc. When we make a get request, we basically request some data from the server. But when we make a post request, we actually send some data from the client to the server. Then we also have put and patch request. We use put and patch request to update an existing resource on the server. Then we also have a delete request. We use delete request to delete a resource on the server. So these are some important HTTP methods which we generally use while developing an application. Then the next part of the start line is the target resource. Here the target resource is this home page. And then the next part of this start line is the HTTP version which we are using. Then a request also has request headers. 
request header is just some information that we send about the request to the server and there are tons of different headers available for example when we are sending a request to the server with the request we can send information like what browser is used to make the request at what time the request was made users browser language and many more information okay so basically request header are the information about the request itself finally depending on the type of http method we are using to make the request we can also have body for the request for example when we are making this get request basically we make get request to get data from the server so in that case with the request we don't send any body so in that case the body can be null but when we are sending a post request that means we want to create a new resource on the server so in that case we need to send the data with the request which we want to create on the server so with the post request we also need to specify the body for the request in the same way we use put and patch request to update resource so with the put and patch request again we need to send some body the data with which we want to update the existing resource okay so depending on the type of http method we are using to make the request we can have the body for the request or we can also not have the body for the request that's all depend on which http method we are using to make the request now one thing which you need to remember here is that how the http request will look like that is not in our hand as a backend developer okay the http request is basically constructed by the client itself so we don't have any control over how the http request will look like but still it's extremely important that you understand what an http request and also an http response looks like because you will be working with them a lot as a web developer as a backend developer and also i want to mention that here we are talking about http request and response but we also have something called as https and the main difference between http and https is that https is encrypted using tls or ssl which are yet some more protocols but we are not going to go deep into that but besides this additional encryption the logic between http request and responses still applies to https all right so our request now hits the server which will be working on it until it has our web page ready to send back and once the web page is ready to send the server will send it with the http response and the http response looks quite similar to the http request here also we have the start line in the start line we have the version of the http we have status code and we have status message the status code and status message is basically used to tell the client whether the request was successful or not so this status code 200 here means the request was successful and the status message is okay but we also have other types of status code like 404 that means the resource which we have requested for from the server that was not found on the server so for that we have the status code 404 then we also have other status code like 500 that means when we request something from the server and if something happens on the server for example if the server goes down or something wrong happens with the server in that case we will get the status code 500 which stands for internal server error so we are going to talk about some of the important status codes in great detail in the future lecture of this section after the start line we have the response header again the response headers contains the information about the response itself and again there are tons of response headers available and we can actually also set up our own custom headers for the response the important thing about response header is that the response headers are created and added to the response by us web developers so we cannot manipulate the http request but we can manipulate the http response before sending it back to the client and finally the last part of the response is again the response body this response body is present for most of the responses and it's also the web developers who specifies and sends back the body in the response so again it's us backend developers it's us web developers who decide what response to send when a request is made to the web application to the server now the body should usually contain the html of the website which we have requested for for example from here we are making a request to this asp.net core web app and there we have requested for this home resource so here in the response we should receive the html of this home page okay so generally in the response we send the html of the website which we have requested for but there are also cases for example in case of a web api we can also send some json data in the response okay 
So we talked in great detail about the most important parts of request and response model or the client server architecture, which is the SCTP request and response. So in this example here, we only sent one request to the demo app.com and got one response. However, if it's a website that we are trying to access, there will be many more requests and responses which will be made automatically by the client. And that's because when we do the first request, all we get back is just the initial HTML file. That HTML file will then get scanned for all the assets that is needed in order to build the entire website. For example, the HTML file might be using JavaScript file, CSS file, images or other assets. Right. And these assets are also stored on the server. So for each of these different assets, the browser will then make a new HTTP request to the server. So basically, this entire back and forth between the client and the server that I just explained, it happens for every single file that is included in the web page. And then finally, when all the files have arrived at the client, the website is rendered in the browser according to the HTML, CSS and JavaScript specifications. So this was a very brief overview of how the HTTP request and response works with a web application. Now, before wrapping up this lecture, let's quickly talk about this TCP and IP and figure out how this request and response data is actually sent across the web. So we learned before that the TCP and IP are the communication protocols that defines how data travels across the web. Now, I'm not going to go into a complete detail here, but here is what you need to know. First of all, the job of TCP is to break up the request and response into thousands of small chunks called packets before they are sent. Then, once they get to their destination, it will reassemble all these packets into the original request or response so that the message arrives at the destination as quickly as possible. Now, this would not be possible if we send the website simply as one big chunk. So, what this TCP protocol does is, it breaks down the request and response into small chunks called as packets so that they can reach to their destination quickly. And once these packets reach to their destination, there, the TCP again reassemble them into the respective request and response. Then, the job of the IP protocol is to send and route all of these packets to the internet. So basically, IP protocol ensures that all these packets arrives at the right destination by using IP address on each of these packets. Okay. Again, this is just a very broad overview of what actually happens behind the scenes of the web. But internally, there are a lot of things going on. All right. So this is all from this lecture. I hope you found this lecture quite informative and very helpful and interesting. In the next lecture, let's talk about HTTP request and response in more detail.